Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, today's Grand Rounds. Uh, before introducing today's speaker, um, I just wanted to make one uh, brief announcement. Next week, uh, Grand Rounds will be the DeHirsch Robinson Lecture, which is um, a sponsored uh, Grand Rounds lecture through the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. Um, our speaker will be Dr. Marianne Wolf, who is the director for the Center for Dyslexia, Diverse Learners, and Social Justice at UCLA. And Dr. Wolf will be presenting on the reading brain in a digital world. So it's a, a real pleasure um, to introduce uh, today's speaker, Dr. Uh, Kevin Bath. Um, Dr. Kevin Bath uh, recently joined us um, at Columbia about six months ago. Dr. Bath is an associate professor of medical psychology in the Department of Psychiatry at Columbia. He completed his undergraduate training at Northern Michigan University and then his PhD in psychology at Cornell University. After completing his PhD, Dr. Bath went on to do a postdoctoral uh, fellowship at Cornell Medical School and then joined the faculty at Brown University in 2011 where he directed the rodent behavioral phenotyping core into, until 2020, when we were fortunate enough um, to recruit him here to uh, Columbia University and the New York State Psychiatric Institute. Dr. Bath is now an associate professor in our department and the director of research in the rodent neurobehavioral analysis core at NISP. His work focuses on the neurodevelopmental impacts of early life stress with an emphasis on cognitive effects as well as sex effects. Um, Dr. Bath's work has been uh, widely recognized, including numerous peer-reviewed articles in highly prestigious journals, um, including Science, PNAS, and the American Journal of Psychiatry. Um, and before turning the floor over to Dr. Bath, I also wanted to mention um, that Dr. Bath joined our faculty um, during the pandemic. Um, it's certainly never easy to join a new department, uh, but I can only imagine a, a particular challenge um, when the department is all working remotely. Um, so I hope that we can give Dr. Bath a particularly warm reception today and look forward to hearing his talk. All right. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, can you hear me well? Okay. Um, sorry, I just wanted to double check there wasn't background noise. Um, and so thank you guys for having me. It's really a pleasure to uh, be able to speak to you. I'm looking at the panelists or, or the attendees and seeing a, a number of familiar names as well as a lot of new names. So it'd be good to uh, introduce you guys to my research. Um, so without further ado, I will uh, jump right in. So again, uh, my name is Dr. Kevin Bath. I, I, came here just a few months ago, but most of my work uh, up until this point, which is going to continue uh, here at Columbia at NISP, has looked at the impact of real life adversity on neural and behavioral development and mainly been doing this from the perspective of using rodent models as kind of a forward translational tool as well as a backward translational tool to make predictions about what you see, what you should see in humans as a consequence of particular experiences as well as trying to model experiences of humans and understand what's going on in terms of the underlying neural circuitry and neural development. I did wanna start out by acknowledging and thanking all the people who are actually doing the work. Uh, so the grad students who stayed at Brown, Megan, as well as uh, Camilla who transitioned as a grad student with me, the Chalice and Maddie who are two technicians who've moved with me to the lab here, uh, as well as Jocelyn who's uh, joined the lab as a postdoc. So these will hopefully be some other friendly faces you'll be seeing around NISP, uh, as well as the funding sources uh, who supported much of the work that I'm gonna talk about today. So again, when we're thinking about um, adversity and development, I don't really have to belabor the point to this crowd that early life adversity significantly increases the risk for a number of negative health outcomes later in life. Some of the more obvious, including risk for affective and emotional pathology, including depression, PTSD, um, anxiety disorders, and so on, as well as cognitive dysfunction, but also leading to changes in quality of life, lifestyle changes, which have consequences far beyond just emotional pathology, elevating risk for obesity, 
cancer, uh, you name it. So really something about those early life experiences and adversity uh, experienced during that early period does shape the entire kind of life course and life health span, if you will, uh, for those individuals. So it really is kind of a critical issue to understand. Another reason that this is important is that unlike many disorders, adversity is actually highly prevalent. So uh, based upon the ACEs study, uh, just surveying individuals uh, and identifying those who have had at least one significant qualifying event for extreme adversity during early life, uh, almost 64% of individuals will report at least one significant adverse event early in life, whether it be loss of a parent, uh, incarceration of a parent, um, drug abuse in the household, abuse, psychological, sexual, so on. Um, so these are really common experiences. So it's a large percentage, a large swath of the population are having these kinds of experiences early in life, which does have um, long-term consequences, again, across kind of multiple dimensions of health. What I want to do in kind of my program of research is understand how adversity is uh, changing the risk for development of pathology. So can we use animal models to model ELA associated risk for pathology? If we can, can we then use those models to leverage them to understand what are the mechanisms that are conferring risk? What's going on kind of under the hood and changing that leads to these behaviors that are um, things that lead to people to seek out uh, assistance, seek out help, seek out, seek out therapy and reach diagnostic classification for having disorder. Um, in addition, might some of these ELA associated pathologies be maybe uh, not necessarily a breaking of the brain, but maybe a miscalibration of development such that individuals have adapted inappropriately to their environment such that now their behavioral profiles classify as pathology, but it was just basically them adapting to that early experience. And I'll, I'll talk about some ways in which uh, some of these animal models might be speaking to that uh, idea. So as I mentioned before, we use a model system approach. So we don't study humans per se, we study uh, mice. Um, one of the reasons that we study mice is that they allow us great genetic control, which uh, isn't often afforded in humans. In addition, it allows us precise control of the environment. So we can control exactly the type and timing of stressor that these animals experience uh, over the course of their lifespan. In addition, we can look at the neural underpinnings of behavior as well as complex behavior, which uh, serves as endophenotypes that can translate into uh, human behaviors and understanding human behaviors, as well as we can take complex human behaviors and start to model those in the case of the animal. So it allows us a, a really kind of wonderful and powerful tool to look at development. In addition, development is much shorter. So in, the, in this case, you see mice developing from postnatal day one to 21. So they're basically going from birth to early adolescence in three weeks instead of in 13 years. Um, so uh, really kind of rapid discovery for uh, testing out our hypotheses. So in terms of the type of adversity, uh, as I mentioned before, based on the ACEs study, there's a, a lot of different things that would classify as adversity early in life. The particular model that we're using is a limited access to resources. Um, so basically we're taking away a lot of the resources that the mother mouse needs to take care of her young, which induces a high stress phenotype in that mother and changes the way that she's caring for the young. So it's not a neglect model. It's not necessarily an abuse model per se. It's basically a model in which you don't have the resources you need to take care of the young. And what does that do in terms of maternal behavior? And what does that do in terms of the development of the pups? So some really nice work done by both Tyler Durham's lab as well as by Megan Gallo in the lab actually quantified the impact of this kind of uh, limited resources on maternal behavior. And this loss of resources of the mother, so she no longer has adequate nesting material and she no longer has adequate bedding material to build a nice nest for her pups. She instead is on this grid floor with only a partial nestlet to build a um, nest for her, her, for her babies. And what this does is it drives high stress in the mother and it changes the, dy the dynamics of care. So basically the total amount of care that the mom is providing the time on nest is the same, if not greater for those mothers who don't have resources. However, the care becomes highly fragmented. They are leaving and returning to the nest much more often. So um, a typical mother will go leave the nest, get something to eat, get something to drink, take care of herself, return to the nest for an extended group um, bout of maternal care. In the case of limited bedding parents, the mom will leave the nest, get something to eat, come back and check on the pups, go get something to drink, 
come back, check on the pups. So it's basically inducing this almost hypervigilant parenting style from the uh, them, from the, the mother mouse. Um, so we're dealing with a kind of a, a stressed out parenting when the mother lacks resources. So what does this do in terms of the development and the risk for pathological behaviors? So in the case of mouse phenotyping, uh, we have difficulty in terms of asking the mouse uh, how they feel, how long they've been feeling a given way. So uh, we have to come up with other ways of assaying those kinds of behaviors. Um, so we have our number of marker tasks to look at dimensions of um, depressive like behaviors or dimensions of pathology in the case of these animals. In this case, we're looking at one dimension anhedonia by looking at the preference of an animal to seek out sucrose laced water versus plain water and identifying anhedonia as a lack of preference or diminished preference for the sweetened uh, water compared to the control. And what we find in the case of these animals is that the females show a increase in the anhedonia phenotype as evidenced by a decrease in preference for sucrose and that between adolescence and adulthood, this uh, phenotype becomes stronger. In addition, we can look at despair-like behavior or almost a learned helplessness using a task called the force swim task. And again, in the case of these animals, we feel, see a female specific risk where females who are raised under limited bedding, or in this case, we call it early life stress, early life adversity, show an increase in learned helplessness uh, by exhibiting an increased uh, latency or decreased latency and increased likelihood of just giving up and floating in this particular apparatus and not continuing to try to escape from the apparatus. So both an anhedonia phenotype, a learned helplessness phenotype, and in the context of anxiety provoking situations when the animal is put into a new cage, are they willing to approach something that they really like? Well, in this case, animals raised under early life stress conditions, specifically the females, show an increased anxiety induced anhedonia in that context all kind of markers of uh, depressive like or features of depressive like behavior in the case of these animals. Now, all these tasks that I'm talking about are relatively uh, acute challenges. So it's basically putting the animal into a conflict situation or putting the animal into a choice situation and relatively short in duration and looking at the behavioral phenotype of those animals during the short duration. However, in the case of many forms of pathology, these are things that are kind of life course changing, changing the day-to-day -day activity, the day-to-day -day feelings, can we get kind of into the mouse's head and get a better sense of um, the behavior and whether or not this is truly recapitulating some of the behavioral features of pathology in the case of these animal models, as opposed to just on these singular marker tests. So as opposed to a clinical diagnostic interview, can we actually look at what's going on in terms of these animals' day-to-day -day life? Well, with new uh, advances in computer vision, we can start to look at those kinds of measures. So this was a system that was developed in collaboration with uh, Dr. Thomas Serra at uh, Brown University, where we used computer vision to train cameras on a mouse's home cage and basically have the computer watch the behavior of the animal in the home cage 24 hours a day, seven days a week um, to see what it is that those animals are doing. And the computer actually identifies every single behavior that that animal engages in, whether they're walking, resting, rearing, grooming, sniffing, hanging, eating, drinking, what have you. And it force classifies that um, on a frame by frame basis. So you can see that it's picking up when animals are hanging, when they're grooming, when they're sniffing or eating. Uh, and then we can develop ethograms for these animals. So what we have here is a continuous measure of behavior. This is resting behavior average across five days. And this is the 24 hour circadian span. So what you can see in this case is normal circadian behaviors where the animals uh, engage in um, changes in resting behavior, specifically during the day, they're sleeping a lot, and then they wake up and rest less during the transitions between light and dark. Uh, what's curious is that when we look at the impact of early life adversity on this in female animals, is that the female early life adversity animals, the female limited bedding animals show basically almost like a hypersomnia phenotype where they're sleeping all the time not getting up, not walking around nearly as much. In addition, they show a significant reduction across the uh, span of the day in terms of grooming behavior or self-care. Uh, in addition, we see decreases in locomotor activity. So across these five days of recording, across this continuous measure, we see additional behavioral features of depression, such as the hypersomnia, the diminished self-care, psychomotor retardation. Um, in addition, what this provides us, I should mention that males, this also replicates the fact that females are selectively impacted as males show no effects on those depressive like measures. 
But what this then allows us to do is take those measures and do an intervention. So in this case, we injected animals with a single dose of ketamine, which is uh, a newly used atypical antidepressant that has rapid antidepressant properties mm -hmm. to see if we could actually resolve those behaviors within subject on these continuous uh, measures. Uh, what was really interesting about this is we actually did rescue the behavioral phenotypes, suggesting that not only do these look, smell, and feel like depressive features in these animals, but they also respond to uh, antidepressants in the same way in terms of resolving those symptoms. What this also provided what us with was looking at uh, side effect profiles of these. Uh, and one of the things that we discovered in the case of animals who were treated with ketamine, all animals, whether they were males or females, early life stress or not, showed an increase in eating and drinking behavior in this particular apparatus, suggesting that uh, one of the consequences of ketamine treatment, in addition to resolving depressive-like symptoms in female mice, may be an increase in phagic behavior, increase in food intake, which we know based upon SSRI treatments uh, and a number of other antidepressants, one of the big things in terms of adherence uh, has to do with whether or not there's weight gain associated with um, taking a, a given medication uh, with many kind of teen populations uh, avoiding uh, medications because of the associated weight gain. So this may be uh, a similar consequence in the case of uh, ketamine. So to summarize this uh, first part of the talk, this early life adversity leads to depressive like behavior, uh, specifically in females. So replicating the female risk in terms of uh, depressive like uh, behavior or development of depression. Uh, that depressive like phenotype worsens through adolescence and it's if, um, the effects of early life adversity are responsive to antidepressant treatment, uh, which provides us with a fertile testing ground to look at the mechanisms supporting that depressive like phen phenotype, as well as uh, the testing ground for developing and testing interventions and understanding possibly some of the sex disparities in risk for development of depression uh, following early life adversity. So in order to uh, dig a little bit deeper, uh, what I mentioned at the start of the talk is we really want to understand what are the mechanisms that are conferring the risk for the development of these behavioral um, features that look like pathology in the case of these animals. Um, is this necessarily a miscalibration of systems? So when we think about adversity, when we think about stress, often everyone thinks about stress as being something that is uh, bad for the system, something that's basically breaking the system. Uh, you hear terms such as toxic stress or that this is driving atypical development and the kind of term pathology for many of these uh, behavioral outcomes. Uh, however, stress isn't necessarily good or bad. It's basically just a signal that's out there in the environment telling the biological system about what it is that's out there and how it should respond. So is stress really doing something to necessarily break the system? Or is it basically just changing the way that the system is responding to and de developing in response to the uh, environment? With this system, we can actually start to look at uh, those kinds of uh, measures and understand this kind of from a, a more nuanced perspective. So in order to do that, we investigate kind of the broad effects on brain and behavior. So we look across not only depressive like behaviors, but uh, a whole range of different phenotypes, including cognitive outcomes, motor sensory development, as well as affective development. In addition, we don't merely focus on outcome measures. So I provided some data for you on adolescence and adulthood, but we also focus on entire neurodevelopmental trajectories. So basically how this is changing developmental course in these animals, not necessarily just outcomes. In addition, we use a number of different marker tasks, almost as kind of soft signs of alter developmental process. So whether that be similar to what you'd see in terms of developmental milestones for growth, head circumference, um, sitting up and things like that in kids, we can see the same kinds of things in the case of these animal models of soft signs for kind of symptoms that will be portending risk for uh, pathology or pathological behavior later in life. Um, in addition, we try to understand these behaviors and these changes in behavior in the context of the development of the system, so how the system is coming online, as well as the life history and um, evolutionary fitness of the animal. So why would you see these changes in response to these particular kinds of uh, adversity? So when we think about developmental trajectories, there's a number of different trajectories that you could anticipate, things that are increasing with uh, age, whether that be at kind of the neural level. Here we're seeing the differentiation of inhibitory interneurons. 
You could also th see things changing just in terms of growth curves of the individual, um, cognitive performance changing over the lifespan. There's some things that are relatively stable across the lifespan and th some things that are declining over the course of life uh, lifespan. One of the problems is that our stress manipulation is relatively global. It's impacting stress physiology, the maternal behavior, the physical experience, the sensory experience of these animals early in life, as well as the nutrition of the animal. So should we be predicting targeted effects on specifically systems that are associated with emotional processing, or are these gonna be more global? So this is part of the reason that we have to look a bit broader than just one particular phenotype, one particular outcome in one particular uh, brain region. And then we can look for whether it be disruptions, damage, uh, discrete changes, adaptation um, to those experiences, and then how long lasting those effects are. So one of the systems I'm going to spend kind of most of the time on and stay in for at least a little bit of this talk is the development of the uh, threat learning circuit. So the threat learning circuit is interesting in that it's really important in terms of identifying um, things that are dangerous within your environment and choosing and responding to those threats within uh, the environment. But what's interesting about this system is that it is not necessarily there and fully functional at birth. It is a system that develops and becomes more nuanced in terms of its ability to mount responses. So some really nice work showing this is that uh, is from Regina Sullivan's lab where she showed that at postnatal day eight, if you do an odor shock pairing for an animal, if you pair an odor with an aversive stimulus such as a shock, very early on the animals can sense the shock, they can sense the odor, but for whatever reason they don't develop an avoidance response to that odor shock pairing. Very early in development, the animals actually develop an appetitive response. So if you shock an animal to an odor prior to postnatal day 10, those animals later on in life will actually approach that odor as opposed to learn to avoid that odor. The ability to pair and identify a negative consequence to basically start to learn to avoid that odor that was paired with a shock doesn't come online until around 10 to 12 days of age in the case of rats or mice associated with the development and responsiveness of both the, the basolateral amygdala as well as connections to the central amygdala to modify that fear response. In addition, your ability to process signals within the environment, whether those be contextual signals or cues that are directly predictive of something bad happening, are, again, things that are emerging as different nodes of these circuits integrate with kind of the system that's important for mediating the stress response, mediating the behavioral response to stress, whether those be the basal outer amygdala, the central amygdala, or engagement of the HPA axis. So we can actually take and measure the development of various types of behavior that are dependent upon various nodes within these circuits to basically look at the timing of engagement of those processes, timing in the ability to mount those responses and how early life adversity is impacting those trajectories of development of those particular behaviors to understand what's going on in terms of not only regional brain development, but how these circuits are integrating and interacting to regulate the emotional responding of the system over the course, over the course of uh, early life. So to provide um, a first example, uh, back in 2011, when I was in uh, Francis Lee's lab, a graduate student in lab, Siobhan Patwell, which identified a thing called contextual fear inhibition, where you take a mouse and you train them within a box and you shock them in that box. And one day later, you put them back into that box to see whether or not they remember that box was a environment where something bad happened and whether or not those animals then freeze in response to being placed back in that box where something bad had happened. Animals can do this uh, as early as 18 to 19 days of age, uh, actually slightly earlier, they can generate a reasonably robust freezing response in response to a context where they had a negative experience. What's curious about this is that there seems to be this dip in the ability to do this uh, particular type of freezing or the um, willingness to engage in freezing where animals don't freeze nearly as much right around postnatal day 28. Uh, Francis' lab has followed up on this and showed that this is associated with a bloom in connections between prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus that actually transiently suppresses that ability which then becomes unmasked as those uh, connections are pruned back. So you can actually use this as kind of a marker for the development of the hippocampus and projections into the hippocampus based on the timing of this suppression in contextual fear memory. We did this same exact thing. So this is actually data replicating this at Brown, um, showing that we see the same 
uh, timing of that effect. But what was curious is that animals who were raised under limited bedding conditions, or in this case, early life stress, showed that same dip in behavior. But instead of this behavior occurring at postnatal day 28 and 29, it was happening at postnatal day 22. It was actually shifted up in terms of uh, time course where the animals were showing the dip, but they were showing the dip earlier than they should necessarily show it. Had we not tracked this from kind of a developmental trajectories point of view, we may have said that, well, the system is broken here, it's working too well here, it's not functioning here, but actually what we're seeing is this actually a normative developmental curve that's just shifted up. It's not a specific deficit at any given time point, it's a change in the time course of development of those circuits. Well, this is all well and good in terms of understanding what's going on in terms of the behavior, but what's happening kind of at the underlying neural level in the case of these animals. We could take out the hippocampus, hippocampus of these animals and measure the maturation of the brains of these animals, of these particular um, regions of the brain. And what we actually uh, observe, and I'm not going to belabor what these specific things are, but we actually see that early life's adversity is driving a precocious maturation of this particular system. It's driving the earlier differentiation of inhibitory inner neurons. It's driving earlier shift in uh, synaptic maturation. It's driving an earlier shift in the myelination of the system, suggesting that not only is our behavior shifted up, but also the neural circuitry underlying that behavior is accelerated, suggesting that stress is driving a precocious maturation of this particular circuit, driving precocious expression of uh, these particular behaviors over development of these animals. So almost like early life adversity is forcing you to grow up too soon. In the case of this particular behavior, sure enough, it is actually making the animal grow up too soon in terms of this hippocampal dependent memory. So summarizing that little bit of the talk, early life adversity can support accelerated maturation, which isn't necessarily breaking the brain. It's suggesting that the brain is actually developing faster than it should, almost like an adaptation to having experienced adversity such that now this response of the system is pushed up in terms of its uh, development, in terms of its functionality. However, I wanna, do wanna introduce the caveat that this is a marker task. So it's not that early life adversity is accelerating this for the purposes of contextual fear inhibition. We're using contextual fear inhibition to measure behavioral development. And what it's showing us is that there's precocious hippocampal maturation. It may be for some entirely other process, but it does at least give us the kind of toehold to see this acceleration and maturation, both at the behavioral and neural level. But as to whether or not it's for that particular type of behavior, we're not sure. Um, so summarizing that, early life adversity is changing the dynamics of regional brain development, accelerating hippocampal development. We can use a, a very similar task. In essence, this is almost exactly the same task, except we're providing the animals with two different contexts, a context A and a context B, where they learn about those particular contexts. Now we place the animal into a context, and now in response to a tone, the animal gets shocked in response to the tone. So now there's something that directly predicts a negative consequence. At the end of each tone, you're gonna to get a shock. We then place the animal back into the context where nothing bad had previously happened to them and present them just with the tone to look at the animals responding to the tone, whether or not they learn that that tone predicted something bad um, is about to happen independent of the contextual cues. Uh, so this engages kind of the, the same fear learning circuit, but seems to be much more dependent upon the basal lateral amygdala, as opposed to uh, integration of information from hippocampus and other regions of the brain to regulate the freezing behavior. So we can actually look at a different uh, node or the functioning of a different process within uh, this very similar task. And we can do that across development using different cohorts of mice at different developmental time points. And so consistent with what we saw in things like the hippocampus and previous literature, um, animals show this normative developmental trajectory becoming better at this. And we predicted that they would show an acceleration maturation. But as my slide jumped ahead of me, uh, we actually see that their life adversity animals don't show that. They actually show a continued deficit at postnatal day 21. And if you interpret this as a curve, it would suggest that these animals are actually delayed in the maturation of this particular form of fear learning. Uh, one of the questions, well, the hippocampus is accelerating, behavior and neural markers in the hippocampus are accelerating. Why is the same thing not happening necessarily in the case of the amygdala, this very similar behavior 
uh, for these animals. Is, is this a delay? Is this an inability to freeze? Likely not because they can do it in the um, contextual fear condition task. Is this a forgotten memory or is something else going on? Uh, what we could do is a, a fairly nuanced task where we could test the animals following fear conditioning one hour later. So no longer do they have to consolidate the memory. It's very recent experience. Six hours later, after the animals have kind of had a bit of time to calm down, 24 hours later, which is a full day remote from when the task had happened, as well as seven days later, so a full week um, from the task. Again, different cohorts of animals. And what we found uh, during this particular uh, paradigm was that one hour after the task, the animals can freeze just fine in response to the tone. These animals have learned something, are able to freeze. Um, it's not that they, they aren't able to engage in that particular behavior, but sometime between six and 24 hours later, the ability of those animals to freeze seems to go away. The animals are just walking around the uh, apparatus, treating it as if they've never been there, that nothing is going on in the background, that that tone means nothing, uh, until seven days later. Seven days later, these animals have had no additional experiences and the freezing returns in the case of those animals. So what seems to be happening in this situation is that uh, the animals are learning about that tone, predicting a shock, but after six hours, after 24 hours, once they're remote from that particular experience, for a period of about a week, the animals have no behavioral uh, manifestation of the emotional responding to that tone shock pairing. But by about a week later, that fear memory uh, is now expressed again in the case, in the, in the uh, form of freezing behavior. Suggesting that that memory has always been there, but for whatever reason, for that period of about a week, the animals weren't able to behaviorally express that fear memory in the form of fear learning. Uh, so we looked at a number of different markers of circuit maturation. Again, we we're focusing on the BLA, which is an area that has been heavily implicated in mediating this particular kind of behavior. And looking at a specific class of cells, we found uh, one class of cells that actually showed changes in time course of maturation, these parvalbumin inhibitory interneurons within the BLA, who actually would, that actually showed a precocious maturation. Curious about this class of cells is that people have done really nice work optogenetically showing that if you activate these cells, you actually silence the ability of animals to freeze. If you silence these cells, you enhance uh, animals uh, freezing in these types of setups. So what's happening here as a consequence of real life adversity, we're getting a precocious maturation of this particular class of cells that seem to be highly responsive to stress, which may be diminishing the ability of those animals to freeze during this P21 time point. Uh, Gabriela Manzana Neves, who was in the lab at the time, did a really elegant series of studies where she used optogenetics to silence those cells at that particular time to directly test that hypothesis that maybe these precociously matured PV cells are inhibiting the ability of animals to express that freezing be behavior by gating the output from the basal arval amygdala. And sure enough, what she showed was that if she uses light to silence parvalbumin cells, she can restore normative fear conditioning in those animals and normative levels of freezing behavior in those animals at the post test at the post test at 21 days of age suggesting that those that precocious development of parvalbumin cells within the amygdala in response to their life adversity may be impacting the ability of animals to gate or express that fear response or manifest it in the form of freezing behaviors despite the fact that that memory is still there and just not being acted upon in the case of those animals so summarizing that, uh, early life adversity is accelerating not only the hippocampus, but also aspects of the BLA. But if you don't look at both of these measures in concert, you may have thought that the basal outer amygdala was delayed in its maturation, the hippocampus was accelerated. Turns out you get different behavioral phenotypes in terms of the acceleration and the delay, but as a similar consequence, both of these showing uh, precocious maturation. Uh, but in the case of the BLA of an inhibitory uh, cell type, which basically manifests as diminished expression of given behavior. So early life adversity is driving dynamic changes in response to threat and that these are evolving over the course of development. And where this becomes uh, interesting, and I'm going to go way off and start to think about implications, which is beyond my pay grade in terms of understanding what this means in terms of human pathology. Uh, but it reminds me of work done by uh, Marty Teicher, where they looked at kids who were the victims of uh, abuse early in life and looked at the time course of development and manifestation of symptoms. So reading, le reaching diagnostic criteria for things like depression or PTSD is a consequence of that. 
So in many children, you see this very early exposure to those uh, various forms of abuse, but you often see this strange latent period where there's no expression of pathology until these individuals or no uh, symptoms that can be clearly classified as being pathological until weeks, years, uh, months later in the case of some individuals. Uh, might this be one of the mechanisms whereby those early experiences are driving uh, changes in trajectory of development, which are masking some of the symptoms by a diminishing access to kind of that emotional state in the case of those individuals uh, associated with those things that were directly um, associated with the threat. Again, this is me going way outside and well beyond the data, but uh, a, a kind of interesting series of studies that seems to match up with some of the things we're seeing in terms of threat learning in the case of these um, animals. So we can go a little bit further and look at other kinds of outcomes in these animals using that same task. And I'll give you uh, a couple of just quick examples before changing gears. And I'll check my time because I'm running up on time a little bit. So we can look at nuanced effects on fear learning. So not necessarily just looking at the freezing behavior of the animals, but the types of coping strategies that animals engage in in response to uh, threat that is uh, impending. So in the case of females, you generally in these types of tasks see a more active coping strategy where the females are more prone to kind of run and jump and try to escape the threat, whereas males are much more likely to basically just continuously engage in that freezing behavior. That's uh, shown by here where females are have an increased likelihood of being what's called darters or jumpers. Uh, what was curious is that uh, being raised under limited bedding conditions or early life adversity basically ablates this effect in females. So it basically shifts females from that active coping strategy to try to escape to a more passive coping strategy, much like what we see in kind of your prototypical males in this particular type of task. Um, we're hoping to look more into the circuitry that's underlying that particular type of behavior and the development of those um, phenotypes. Uh, but I think that's interesting in terms of some of the sex differences that we're, we're hoping to see. In addition, uh, Camilla Dastri is working on setting up and reestablishing this task at uh, NISPI, but looking at a fear potentiated startle. So again, looking at how animals respond to uh, being shocked as well as to unpredictable stimuli within the environment. And what she's observed is that rearing under limited bedding conditions or early life adversity is potentiating the startle response, both when it's predicted as well as when it's not predicted in the case of females, an effect that's not seen in males suggesting that females are exhibiting an enhanced vigilance behavior in response to early adversity rearing. And so we're working on dissecting uh, some of the impacts of early life adversity on neural circuitry underlying this, but both of those behaviors are implicating kind of subcortical uh, limbic structures. So most of what I've shown you so far are behaviors that are largely dependent upon regions such as the hippocampus, the amygdala, the BNST, and a lot of these are showing kind of this uh, limbic or paralimbic acceleration in maturation response to early life adversity. One of the questions that we have is, is this generalizable to the rest of the brain? Is basically early life adversity telling the brain to wholesale accelerate its maturation? Or is this an adaptation and acceleration the maturation of centers of the brain that are important for threat detection, for moderating kind of an emotional response, and you're not seeing the same consequences in other regions of the brain? Well, we've done a couple of studies in the Chalice of Frey, who I think is on the call here right now, uh, is a technician in the lab. She's been working on a fear contagion task and the social transmission of fear. I'm trying to pepper in a little bit of new data where you look at animals who are observing another animal who are being shocked in response to a tone and see whether or not those animals not having been shocked themselves under these conditions, but just watching another animal be shocked, actually learn to fear the tone that was predicted of the other animal receiving the shock. So it's basically a, a what's called a fear contagion or a social transmission of fear, which is thought to kind of engage uh, similar kind of empathic processes in the case of the observer animal. Uh, and regions of cortex, such as anterior singlet cortex, have been implicated in mediating this particular uh, behavior. Some super cool new data, uh, she's actually shown that females who are reared under limited bedding conditions show a diminished uh, freezing behavior in response to watching other animals get shocked, almost as if these limited bedding females show a loss of empathic fear that you would see in typical female uh, mice reared under these conditions with uh, very little effect in male animals, suggesting that there may be some impact of early life adversity on integration of the anterior cingulate into the threat circuitry. 
So moving a little bit further afield um, and into uh, other tasks, so not belaboring kind of the, the threat learning uh, aspect of things, and to really kind of test that subcortical versus cortical or limbic versus cortical maturation, uh, we wanted to look at a number of different measures in terms of uh, cortical maturation, in terms of um, sensory motor processing, as well as kind of complex cognitive behaviors in the case of these animals. So I mentioned previously that in hippocampus, basolateral amygdala are showing this precocious development with the red being the parvalbumin cells and the maturation of those cells. So we're seeing those mature faster in the case of those animals as evidenced by this shift left in that kind of red curve. Uh, what was curious is that we look at a number of different regions, including primary sensory cortex, primary somatosensory cortex, primary motor cortex, visual cortex, Using that same index of maturation, the relative development of parvalbumin cells, it seems that animals reared under limited bedding conditions are actually delayed in their maturation of many of these regions in the case of sensory development, motor development, uh, and so on, suggesting that not every part of the brain is accelerating in response to that early life adversity. Some are actually showing what appear to be delays in maturation. And we can take and use um, more kind of soft sign marker tests of development, such as eye opening in these animals, which happens postnatally. So we can track when the eyes are opening and consonant with the delay in visual system development or visual cortical development, we actually see delays in the onset of eye opening. So real manifestations in terms of the timing of visual maturation in the case of these animals, suggesting that sensory development is delayed. Uh, we also see delays in motor milestones, such as the writing reflex, which is basically very similar to kids. When can they sit up? When can they roll over from their from a supine to a prone position? We're doing the exact same thing in the mice. And generally, they are really poor at this at six days of age, get better by nine. The animals who are control are much faster at doing this and improve much more quickly than animals reared under limited bedding conditions or other types of early life adversity suggesting that that adversity is not only delaying maturation of cells within these regions, but also manifesting as delays in sensory and motor development in the case of those um, individual animals. We can also look at um, other cortical regions such as the prefrontal cortex. In this case, um, this is whole cell prefrontal cortex. We look at the development of parvalbumin cells and we see the onset of maturation of those cells with their life adversity females showing delays in the onset of maturation in that particular region. We did some, or Haley Goodwell, who was in the lab, did some very careful studies to look at the region that was contributing to this delay in maturation and identified that specifically the orbital frontal cortex in the case of these animals is delaying and failing to develop PV cells appropriately. And we tested the animals on an attentional set shifting or attentional learning task and identified that females reared under early life stress conditions actually have very specific deficits in terms of rule reversal learning but not rule shifting, um, suggesting that there are very nuanced effects in terms of your ability to hold a rule in mind and act upon that rule. What was interesting about this study is uh, we identified this first in uh, the mice and we then reached out to collaborators to actually my wife who's a collaborator who does attentional learning in uh, kids who are at risk and actually in one of those populations using a uh, card sort task we identified very similar deficits in terms of in terms of rule reversal learning but not rule shifting in the case of kids who are uh, reared in uh, impoverished environments uh, that may be impacting attentional control or attentional function in those individuals which was actually predicted based upon uh, the mouse model and that females were were most impacted so again kind of feeding into that forward translational model but also highlighting that um, not everything is accelerating. In some cases, some regions of the brain are taking a hit in terms of their development and in terms of their long-term functioning. So all this to try to summarize and give us plenty of time to go through questions and debrief on why I think all of this stuff is happening uh, is that early life adversity is impacting the dynamics of brain development and that these effects are not uniform. So based upon the work that we've done across all of these different brain regions, you see in the case of uh, certain limbic centers, uh, such as the amygdala, the hippocampus, and kind of paralimbic regions, almost a hypertrophy or acceleration in response to being reared under those adverse conditions. However, if you look at other kind of cortical sensory regions, those are actually seeming to take a hit in terms of delaying or not 
having complete maturation of the circuit, suggesting that you're getting kind of this shift toward greater limbic development at the expense of cortical development uh, in the case of these animals, and that there are sex differences in the engagement of these uh, particular adaptive responses, which are driving changes in terms of ultimate phenotype of those animals. So early life adversity is having broad effects on maturation, both on the body as well as on the brain and that are specific to uh, brain regions. Uh, these alterations in timing are region, uh, region and behavior specific, um, that some of the behaviors that we're seeing may be contributing to the development of behavioral phenotypes, which may manifest as symptoms of pathology um, and manifest as sex differences in terms of risk. Um, and that this may depend upon the type of adversity. So I only showed you data from one particular model, this limited resources model. Um, so this is basically a condition in which parents are engaging in this hypervigilant parenting style, this stressed parenting style. We're likely going to see different consequences. And we actually have shown that if you take and use a more neglect-like model, a maternal separation model, where animals lose access to their parent for some period of time, you see different consequences on the dynamics of brain development, suggesting that the very specific effects in terms of recruitment of these systems may be highly dependent upon the exact experience that the animal or that the individual is receiving early in life. Arguing that in clinical populations in those ACEs studies, while adverse experiences are contributing to elevated risk, each of those different experiences may be driving differential risk in terms of the very specific behavioral phenotypes or the specific features of a pathology, especially in spectrum disorders that um, encompass a lot of different kind of features in terms of um, the symptom uh, profile. In addition, when we think about this, well, why is this happening? It, everything that we're, we're observing in this in terms of many of these accelerations and delays are arguing that stress isn't necessarily breaking the brain, it's basically telling the brain to mature differently, to basically develop in a different um, way. And it's driving precocious or adaptations in terms of some of these limbic centers, delaying cortical centers, which may be um, supporting some kind of evolutionary ad ad advantage for those animals to drive the development of behaviors which may be beneficial for them in contexts of high adversity if they continue to find themselves in conditions of high adversity and make them perfectly adapted for those situations. But if there's a mismatch between what they've adapted to expect and the ultimate environment that they find themselves in, this is where you may see those behaviors that have been adapted for, which may have been beneficial based upon what their brain was expecting, driving changes in behavior which may not be suited for that particular environment and which may then lead to a result in classification of pathology, but not because the brain broke, but because the brain adapted for an environment that it wasn't necessarily ultimately finding itself in. In addition, you can then recruit different evolutionary theories, arguing that maybe this is a, a predictive adaptive response of the brain to anticipate the environment it's going to find itself in, that there may be sex differences in the way that you recruit that based upon um, different uh, things that are beneficial in terms of sex selection in males versus females and so on. So that can be driving some of those differences. Um, and that it also does argue that um, the mechanisms that are underlying pathology may not just be you know, broken regions. It may be changes in relative contribution of different regions of the brain to a given behavior, changes in the integration of those uh, nodes into a given circuit, uh, as well as argues that there may be important information from using these developmental trajectories to understand plasticity of the system, as well as kind of the timing of maturation, the timing of uh, symptom identification and uh, intervention to kind of normalize or to course correct in terms of the environment that the animal or individual will find themselves in the future to improve the kind of match between those um, early in development. And I just wanted to highlight that we're doing a number of additional studies looking at other features of behavior which may feed into other kinds of pathology such as feeding behavior and eating disorders, reward learning um, for uh, choice and um, Boarding behaviors, looking at reproductive development, looking at genetic factors that may confer risk of resilience, looking at whether or not we can provide interventions that increase the predictability of care in this manipulation to see if that buffers against some of the stress effects, and looking at uh, other processes of olfactory or perceptual learning in the case of these animals to look at other dimensions of sensory development. And with that, I will wrap up. Thank everyone again who's been doing all of this work. Thank the funders.
and probably give a lot more kind of context as questions come in. So that we can stop and I can reshare if we need to. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, Kevin. That was uh, really an extraordinary uh, talk and really inspiring. Um, and I can say as someone who studies uh, early life adversity um, in children and humans, um, it's hard not to be envious of the, the level, the, the exquisite control um, that you're able to leverage, you know, at the genetic background in terms of the exposure, the behavioral outputs um, and the molecular work. It's, it's really extraordinary. Um, so I, I have some questions, but I, I first wanted to turn it over to Dr. Lieberman to, to see if he has any questions. Uh, Kevin, thank congratulations. That was a, a, an outstanding talk. And uh, um, uh, obviously you were a great recruit and uh, um, kudos to, to Jay and to developmental neuroscience for orchestrating you. I hope you're happy and I hope, I hope your wife is happy in psychology. Um, so as you were uh, you know, going through your presentation, it made me think of how the uh, use of rodent models uh, for mental illness as a uh, model system has evolved. And, and I'm sort of dating back to Jackie Crawley with her, What's Wrong With My Mouse? Um, you know, the, the book, uh, which sort of uh, put this on the map. Um, uh, and, um, you know, just to be a little bit provocative though, um, uh, one of the things that's uh, been, although rodent models and particularly mice have been, you know, critical for studying the biology of uh, 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 susceptibility genes and in a variety of other uh, uh, contexts. Um, there's been um, a degree of not skepticism, but uh, un, I guess, uh, shaken confidence in their reliability to predict um, uh, the effects of drugs uh, in, in when they when they are uh, moved to human testing, um, the predictive validity of the animal models showing efficacy of specific compounds hasn't translated well, and it probably varies disorder by disorder. But um, I wondered if you could sort of comment on the uh, you know what you see as the reasons for that, or anything that could be done to try to improve upon that, or any cautionary uh, principles that you've you've learned in the course of your work? No, absolutely. I think, I mean, the use of animal models as kind of predictive translational tools, I think has great power, but it also has great power to be used inappropriately and to lead you down kind of the wrong street in some, some instances. Um, I mean, as one example, uh, I've had students who, uh, after working in my lab, have gone on to do internships at pharmaceutical companies and there'll be companies like Janssen Pharmaceutical who will just repeatedly use for swim test as their predictive marker for antidepressant response in the case of animals. And they will screen 600 compounds based upon that single task. And it's not clear that that single task is necessarily the best marker task for antidepressant response, despite you know many people using it as a go-to for measures of learned helplessness, that you have to be much more kind of careful and nuanced with um, using your behavioral markers and understanding um, how they're impacting the behavior and what dimensions of behavior that you want to be studying in terms of translating into the human and translating in term, in, into in terms of the therapeutic response. So I think being being much more careful with the assays that you're using to screen these compounds is going to be important, but there's also going to be um, different effects that are not going to be useful. So in this case of some uh, study, some there are species differences in terms of the development of specific receptor systems, the expression and insertion of different receptors on populations of cells. So thinking about stuff that you may be interested in terms of D1, D2 expression and screening for compounds for uh, schizophrenia or uh, psychopathy, you may see different behavioral responses to the animal because basically the limit or the striatal system has developed differently enough that you actually are losing some of the predictive validity in terms of translating from the mouse to the human, but it may be more beneficial in terms of other systems that are more kind of phylogenetically conserved uh, across mouse and human. So. Well, along those lines, just one final question. Um, what's your impression of, of the uh, atheoretical phenotypic profiling that's been done uh, uh, and psychogenics is kind of uh, uh, championed? Yeah, no, there's uh, the psychogenics, there's the other people who are using the um, locomotor activity of animals and training systems on 
select classes of cells, the behavioral profiles that animals engage in in response to that, and then screening new compounds to predict which class of um, drugs they most resemble in terms of the behavior response of the animal. I think that's you know really nice in terms of being able to classify the new group of drug, but I think really kind of where the rubber meets the road is moving these now into kind of the next phases of uh, clinical trial to see if beyond those kind of features of classifying a drug into a category, you then see behavioral response and not just in a single task, but across other tasks that are mapping onto dimensions of illness that would actually, you know, hold better in the case of um, predicting human outcomes. Maybe maybe you could quickly, for people who aren't familiar, that quickly explain what, what uh, uh, you know, sort of empir empirical or a theoretical approach they've taken. Uh, so as a, an example, the one that I'm most familiar with was the, the work where uh, say they had three classes of um, drugs for that are commonly used for treating schizophrenia, three that are commonly used for treating depression, uh, three that are commonly used for anxiety disorders, and three that are pain relieving, relieving medications. Treat the animal with, treat an individual animal or a group of animals with each of those drugs and put them into an open field and just let them freely explore. When they let them freely explore, then they then measure the behaviors. They measure turning velocity, locomotor activity, um, acceleration rates, uh, all of these different measures. And then they put it into a machine learning system to basically see if they can find dimensions of behavior that cluster into the three drugs that were associated with um, you know, treatment of psychopathy versus treatment of depression versus treatment of anxiety. What are the measures of behavior? So it may be turning angle is highly predictive of having received an anti-anxiety drug. They will then, after training that system, give the animal a new drug from a drug library and say, based on getting this drug, this drug led to high levels of this kind of turn velocity. Therefore, it's most likely to function as an anti-anxiety drug. What led to a similar behavioral profile on that thing, but as to whether or not that's going to be treating anxiety-like symptoms, we don't know. We just know it modifies behavior in that particular apparatus that resembles what other drugs had done in terms of that particular behavior. But you then have to move that into those tasks that are measuring um, better features of anxiety-like behavior as opposed to turn velocity in response to the drug. They may just be generally leading to psychomotor retardation or lethargy or other things which may lead to um, misclassification or false uh, positives in terms of this particular class of drugs. So I think it's it's good for an initial screen, but I think a lot more work has to be done. People have to be much more careful in terms of you know, their behavioral phenotyping and using a multiplicity of tasks that map onto different dimensions of uh, the disorder, because these disorders are really complicated. Even in the case of things like schizophrenia, you get uh, many of your drugs, which will get rid of a lot of your positive symptoms, which are entirely non-functional in terms of alleviating negative symptoms in the case of those. So some of these drugs may be, in, may be good for changing uh, ticks in OCD, but they may not be good in terms of resolving the anxiety that comes comorbid with that um, particular disorder. So. Yeah, they're, they're, one, they're one claim of success or their mo most uh touted claim of success is identifying a trace amine receptor agonist by this profiling technique and putting it into humans and and then finding that it was effective but you know whether that'll hold up in other conditions remains to be seen yeah. or uh, yeah across individuals in the case of some of these disorders being um both polygenic as well as um, double hit with environment as well So Kevin, I actually wanted to um, echo some of the um, concerns or, or issues that, that Dr. Lieberman, Lieberman brought up. Um, so you're, you're using the um, limited betting paradigm um, as a model for adverse childhood experiences, ACEs. And you know, one of the um, concerns that I've heard about that paradigm and would love to get your thoughts on is that um, the, the deprivation can be so severe um, that the offspring actually have nutritional uh, deficiencies. And it may be those nutritional deficiencies that are driving later neurodevelopment rather than the stress per se, um, mm -hmm. which is not necessarily characteristic of ACEs. Um, so, with, you know, obviously no model is perfect, uh, but I would love to get your thoughts on that. No, absolutely. I think, uh, as I mentioned uh, a little bit in that slide and kind of uh, pretended, uh, 
The Early Life Diversity Limited bedding actually is a global effect. So we're impacting nutritional quality of uh, those pups. We're in, impacting possible thermal uh, cycling of those animals. We're impacting the uh, quality of care, the regularity of care. Uh, moms are providing signals in terms of the contact. So those might be different in those animals. The moms may be at different levels of stress, providing basically biological signals to the pups through the breast milk. So all of these are possible ways in which development is being driven kind of off course in response to this limited bedding paradigm. And I think it's on us to understand which of those specifically are driving which phenotypic outcomes. And so to do that, we can be, you know, more careful in terms of measuring the different dimensions. And so I think uh, Megan did a nice job uh, looking at that, seeing that a subset of the parents will engage in a kicking-like behavior, almost a little bit of abusive behavior, but for a very short period of time. So are those animals who not only are getting limited bedding, but also getting kind of that abusive uh, behavior different from the animals who only got limited bedding? In the case of limited bedding, we're now setting up cameras here at NISPE, and so we're getting them in the room to look at very specific effects on maternal behavior. So we know based upon the literature that in response to adversity, females seem to bias their care toward male offspring and neglect females more often. Um, and so are some of the behavioral phenotypes we're seeing in terms of male-female differences because of enhanced neglect in females under these conditions of high adversity. We can then also try to do things where we create a thermal neutral environment. So even though the moms are on and off the nest a lot more, can we regulate the temperature of the pups to make sure that it's not a temperature effect that's driving this? Um, in the case of the nutritional content, there have been other labs and we're you know, hoping to look at this as well, looking at the nutritional content provided by the mother because she's actually spending just as much time nursing and on nest, if not more time on nest, providing care to the young, but maybe the quality of the nutrition is different. In those cases, we can also look at nutritional interventions. So people have been looking at this in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. There was a group in Rhode Island that we were coordinating with where they're doing high protein diets in addition to some of the kind of um, psychosocial support in populations of high adversity to try to basically promote better brain development associated with not only the adversity, but also the nutritional uh, deprivation. So I think all of these are, are important things and important things going into kind of this umbrella effect of limited bedding, but we don't necessarily know the specific features of that particular manipulation that are driving the outcomes. And it may be different for different behaviors. So in the case of the nutritional supplement that might be driving changes in hypothalamic development and uh, parahypothalamic centers, whereas the effects of maternal care may be signaling more to kind of sensory systems, uh, cortical development and so on. So each of those suites of behaviors that mom is providing and mom is signaling may be having different consequences depending upon the brain region. Right. Yeah, so it's similar, you know, in, in human studies, we, you know, we have good reason to believe that poverty tends to have a negative impact on child brain development. But what are the, you know, the, the most salient components of poverty still remains an, an open question. Um, but we have lots of questions from uh, the audience. So let me start uh, reading some of those. So Alexander Harris writes, uh, mice brains develop postnatally in ways that humans develop during pregnancy. Does early life stress in mice model, in, uh, mice model stress during, does it actually model stress during pregnancy in humans? Uh, I, it's a, a really good question. I think it depends on uh, what brain region you're uh, specifically interested in. So it is true that basically the first week postnatal for mice, uh, in essence, is recapitulating third trimester for the most part in humans. But uh, that's a little bit of a, of a nuanced point, because depending upon which region of the brain, there's differences in terms of how you translate time. So in the case of hippocampal development, that first week postnatally is kind of that third trimester to first two years um, prenatally in humans. If you're looking at visual cortical development, that's even shifted a little bit further out in the case of the animals that's almost happening entirely postnatally in the mice. So there's uh, some nice work by when I was a grad student at Cornell, Barb Finley and uh, Barbara Clancy doing translating time and looking at different nodes within uh, different centers of brain and how they translate across species. So understanding what's happening during this first, you know, well, the second week of life for our mice, postnatal day four to postnatal day 11, what that means in terms of time course of development in humans, whether or not we're modeling human prenatal um, experience for 
at the hippocampal level versus human postnatal experience at the cortical level. Um, and I don't think we, we have a good handle or it depends on what your specific question, what your particular uh, area is, um, but, it, but it is important to kind of understand that. Um, in addition, we can try to shift some of these things around to understand whether or not it's the specific period that's important. So ours we've been doing for most all day four to 11. If we shift that up three or four days and try to kind of recapitulate more of the early postnatal period or more of the childhood period, do we get a different phenotype in these animals? Likely you would. So. so William uh, Tucker asks, uh, do female pups of stressed dams exhibit pathological mothering behaviors as adults, even if they are not subjected to deprivation of nesting materials at that time? So looking at intergenerational effects. Yes, yeah, so that's an excellent question and one that we've been we've been working on, but we don't have the, the data fully yet. So we've had a, a couple of fits and starts with doing it, both looking at um, whether or not the mom or whether or not the pup was an early life adversity pup with a limited bedding mom, when she grows up, if she's in limited bedding conditions, if she is basically adapted to that and has expected that and provides normative care versus you get the kind of ghosts in the nursery where even though she is in under limited bedding conditions, if she provides uh, stressed care, much like what her mother provided to her, we're not entirely sure yet, but it's definitely something that we really wanna look at as well as looking at transgenerational transmission from the males who were reared under those conditions, their offspring, their female offspring who go on to mother, what happens in the case of those conditions. Those are, are to be determined, but I think are a really important and interesting question um, to be addressed. So another listener writes in asking, um, how does the emergence of threat associated learning coincide with any GABA shift in the associated brain regions? Um, so that uh, we don't know. I mean, the most data that we have on that has been related to the development of those PV cells, those fast spiking inhibitory interneurons. Um, we haven't looked at uh, other features of um, GABA subunit insertion within the synapses, any changes in terms of uh, LTV, any of the other kind of nuance effects. Uh, basically, what we're doing is using mainly as PV as a marker of maturational timing in the case of these animals, but understanding what those are doing in terms of the um, intrinsic properties of a given node within the circuit, uh, we're not sure. Everything that we've done has been relatively crude in terms of using as a time course tracker and either silencing or stimulating it, but not necessarily measuring it. So I think some of that data is uh, to be determined in terms of understanding what that does in terms of excitatory as well as inhibitory cells within the circuit on task. So it'll be really important to do some of these new um, with fiber photometry as well as uh, in vivo uh, recording in these animals to understand what's going on in terms of um, cellular activity during and, and on task. Um, great, so uh, ACEs increase risk not only for mood disorders but also for substance use disorders. And so Sally Sattel writes in, um, wonderful talk Will you eventually look at preference for drugs such as cocaine as a dependent variable? Uh, so we've started looking at uh, a couple of different things. So we haven't looked at uh, cocaine, but we've looked at um, ethanol consumption. So one of the things that we had or an undergrad actually was doing an honor thesis at Brown had was that maybe with this, we're ending up with animals who are developing depressive like phenotypes. If we give them access to uh, things like ethanol, do these animals self-medicate in essence and like uh, consuming the ethanol. Turns out that uh, CFT7 black six under basal conditions actually like ethanol, will readily drink ethanol, don't have to be trained to drink ethanol. Uh, but what we observed was that in response to limited bedding, the females showed a loss of preference for the ethanol. They basically showed an anhedonia phenotype. So in essence, limited bedding was protective against um, ethanol consumption. Uh, there's another, there's a technician working in the lab right now, Madeline Kritz, who's working on not necessarily drugs, but looking at high fat diet, which you could cons consider sugar, high sugar also being a drug and working under similar systems. Um, but we have predictions that that early life adversity is suggesting that there's a variability in the environment and variability potentially in nutritional resources early in life might change the development of centers of the brain that are important for consumatory behaviors. And that either with a second stress, such as food insecurity later in life, such as food deserts, or access to highly palatable food, 
Possibly some of the appetitive features of those foods along with the insecurity might drive this obesogenic phenotype that you see in the ACEs study. Uh, we're not sure about what's going to happen with that yet in terms of whether or not these animals will show an anhedonia to the uh, Western diet. Um, they really do like it um, so far, uh, but whether or not they'll show anhedonia or whether or not they'll show that insecurity associated binge-like feeding behavior, which might be mediated by some of these kind of reward, reward processing centers, which would tap into kind of that drug abuse um, idea. Great. Um, Ralph Wharton writes in, um, is there any evidence that early life stress in some mice can result in resilience rather than depression? Um, so, yes. <laughs> so I, again, I'm thinking that um, when we measure these behaviors in the animals, we're classifying uh, depression in those animals based upon marker tests. We have no idea whether or not these animals are depressed per se. Uh, again, for, for some people, some people are not people, people, <laughs> people persons, uh, and will engage in a lot of behaviors that would otherwise be classified as depression, but they uh, express no negative consequence of this in terms of their coping, in terms of their lifestyle, in terms of their happiness, and so wouldn't necessarily reach classification for depression. In the case of these mice, we see behaviors in the way that they respond to challenge, in the way that they are active within their cage, but we'll never know whether or not the animals are depressed. We just have tasks that resemble symptoms that we interpret as symptoms that we then have to make predictions about what that means in terms of the human. Ultimately, all this is going to have to go back to the human to see whether or not this is meaningful. So kind of hearkening back to that first question, it's great if these are predictive and we can actually predict outcomes in humans and then go into the human and get kind of more of the nuanced story, more of the kind of um, real life aspect of things. But in the case of the mice, we're not really sure. In terms of the resilience rather than depression, I think that a lot of what we're seeing are again, adaptations of the system. So whether you call it resilience versus depression, I think it depends upon the kind of environment that you find yourself in. So if these animals were to find themselves in a highly variable environment full of predators, they would be perfectly adapted, highly resilient, and less likely to be predated upon and would function well in terms of being impulsive and food opportunities and so on. Whereas the animals reared under control conditions would be maladapted, would be increased likelihood to die, to suffer the negative consequences of those environments. So um, many of the things that we're seeing in the case of these animals are actually probably adaptations and resilient should they find themselves in kind of a, a matched environment. But that does also speak to genetic risk. So in thinking about these adaptations, we've done some studies looking at the mechanisms that might be conferring the adaptation of these animals to that early environment. So trophic factors, much of what I did during my postdoc with BDNF, seem to be important for stimulating the maturation of these symptoms or these systems. So in looking at the response to life diversity, we see precocious metri or precocious expression of BDNF in these circuits, which might be driving the earlier development and maturation of these circuits. We also have animals who have mutations in the BDNF gene that decrease the ability to do what it's supposed to do, in essence, for the, you know, the simplest uh, explanation of it. And in animals who have that mutation, you don't see nearly the same level of adaptation to that early life adversity. So you don't see those same shifts in the case of those animals, suggesting there may be some genetic factor which under normative conditions might be a risk factor, but under conditions of early life adversity may blunt against the ability to adapt to that early environment. And translating that one step further, we've actually worked with um, refugee groups in Syria where they've genotyped individuals who have been displaced and are living in refugee camps and also have diagnostic classification for risk for PTSD. And those individuals who carry the BDNF element mutation show lower risk scores for development of PTSD than individuals who don't carry that mutation, suggesting that there may be some genetic factors of resilience to adaptation to those early experiences. And that's something that we're also exploring both in the mice as well as um, with some of these collaborators. Great. Um, so uh, Steve Bruce asked if you could um, expand a bit on your thoughts about the mechanisms uh, by which the stress in the mother impacts the offspring neurodevelopment. Uh, so that's a good, a good question. So right now um, we're trying to kind of uh, dissect out uh, various features because there are multiple labs who are using this particular kind of uh, limited vetting manipulation and different people have different expectations about what is the critical factor that's driving the, the differences. So 
Tally Barham's lab, who are the one who originally developed this, uh, believe that it's all about the predictability of care. So it's not about the quantity of care, it's not about the stress hormones, it's not about any of these other features, it's about how regular and how well the pups can predict when mom's gonna come back and how mom is going to stay. And they've been looking at that feature and they use a, um, a variability measure in essence. And the higher the variability measure, the worse the outcomes in terms of anhedonia phenotypes in the animals as they age. However, you have other labs who say, well, it's not necessarily the variability in care, it might be just that the moms are providing this stress signal and it doesn't have to be in maternal behavior, but it's mom expressing that through delivery of court through the breast milk. So we can basically take mom out of the equation and treat animals with corticosterone during the same period of time while mom is under normal rearing conditions and you should get the same effects. And you get some similar effects, but you don't get the complete suite of effects. Um, in the case of uh, other individuals, they will remove kind of the wire mesh floor and provide the animal slightly more nesting material and you lose another portion of the effects. In the case of um, some studies we've done in the lab, you take and instead of during the same period of time, instead of limited bedding, you limited ac limit access to mom, but it happens at a regular time every day. You get some common effects in terms of accelerations and delays, but the magnitude of those effects are changed in the case of those animals. So I think that's a, it's an empirical question as to those experiences, but it does speak to the idea that the specific experience that you've had, the quality of the experience, the duration of the experience, and the type of adversity really is going to be important in terms of your prediction of the types of outcomes you're going to see in terms of symptom development, the severity of those symptoms, and the kind of um, ideology of, of the disorder, if they go on to classify it. Um, having disorder. Okay. So I think this might be our last question. Um, so a, a listener writes in, um, does early life stress cause a change in the age of weaning? And is there a sex difference more generally? And I think you may have touched upon this a bit. Um, could early life stress change in dam pup interaction and this change be a mediator of the maturational rate? Um, it does change dam pup interaction we be, we believe we know in, in the case of um, other models that are very similar to this um, such as the one developed by tanya roth and regina sullivan where it's a scarcity adversity model where the animals are cross fostered there's engagement in mothers in abusive like behavior and they tend to target those abusive behaviors to the female animals in the case of some of the work by gibbon and others when you do maternal um, handling where you briefly remove the mom, place them back, they engage in high levels of care for the offspring, and they seem to target that care, that licking and grooming to uh, the male pups. So you get differences in dynamics of care and differences in risk resilience of males versus females based upon how that care is altered in the case of those animals. Um, in terms of what that does in terms of maternal dynamics and what mom is doing, I think there are a number of features of behavior that we have to look at in the case of this uh, model system. So whether or not the licking and grooming is intact, whether or not there are sex biases in terms of engagement in that behavior that are driving the elevated risk in terms of females going on to develop these depressive-like behaviors, whereas many of the animals are showing acceleration in different aspects of these circuits. So what regions aren't um, responding in the same way in both males and females and which are correlated with the specific symptoms for say depressive like disorder versus just uh, general adaptation to the system. Um, this theoretically could impact weaning. The animals are smaller raised under limited bedding conditions than our control animals, um, but we try to match the weaning date in these animals. So the animals in limited bedding are weaned at a smaller size than our controls and we try to compensate for that by providing them with wet food on the floor and access to um, drinking water so that they're not further being impacted by a, not having access to nutrition. But providing extended care to delay weaning in those animals uh, may actually ablate some of our effects. So we have some studies where we're looking at nutritional supplementation later on in life that we piloted while at Brown that may suggest that doing those kinds of interventions may, you know, benefit development of the brain uh, in the case of those animals. Um, so, so we haven't directly tested that, but it, it could impact weaning time.
So I, I apologize, I misspoke when I said that was our last question. Uh, several additional questions just came in and we only have a few minutes left. So I'm gonna to try to go through these sort of rapid fire if that's okay. Um, so um, someone asks, to what extent are early life stress, early life stress effects um, mediated by adrenal hormones? Uh, again, I think it depends on what dimensions you're measuring. So um, again, there are labs like Rick Richardson's lab and uh, Regina's lab who have done the core exposure during this same developmental period and shown things like the acceleration and maturation of the uh, basal lateral amygdala and that kind of shift from pedo to aversive learning in the case of animals, as well as an earlier onset of the um, infantile amnesia uh, behavior in those animals. So at least in the case of from the hippocampal measures, where there's highly responsive centers of the brain to um, stress hormones, you may see those similar accelerations, but you may not see the same sensitivity of other regions of the brain where there not, may not be the same level or the same engagement of um, adrenal hormone uh, receptors. So maybe, you know, some of the uh, paralympic centers that are not as rich in blue cortical and male cortical receptors may be less responsive to the adrenal effects and more responsive to, say, maternal contact or uh, other things that are going to be driving different kind of neuropeptide signaling, such as oxytocin, arginine, vasopressin, uh, or um, serotonin signaling in the case of those animals. So I think, again, it's going to be nuanced. It's going to depend upon the feature of the experience and um, the effects on maternal behavior, because mom is providing a whole suite of signals, whether they be the adrenal, the maternal, and so on. And to a large extent, at these very early time points, the pups are dependent on the mothers for those adrenal signals, because during the very early period, the adrenals are not fully developed in the case of the developing pups, so they aren't able to mount their own adrenal response until they reach around 12 to 14 days of age. So any adrenal signal is basically coming from mom earlier in development. Okay. Uh, Christiane Duarte uh, writes in, do you see any evidence uh, that there may be effects uh, very early on for males as opposed to later effects in females? This seems to be the case for intergenerational effects. It would be interesting to know if you observed anything in the same direction for ELS within one generation. Uh, so we haven't done generational effects. Um, we have seen um, effects that are sex disparate that are impacting males and not necessarily females. So if we do a novel object location task and look at spatial memory processing, we see that males show deficits in terms of this particular kind of behavior that are early emerging and are persistent throughout the life of the animals, whereas females are entirely intact. So it's not that females are always the ones who are at risk. It just in our particular model using the postnatal day four to postnatal day 11 with CP7 black six mice, these are the behavioral phenotypes that we've observed and also looking across uh, these different contexts. In the case of um, thinking about males and male risk, I think one of the things that I didn't touch on before uh, that might be interesting is that in the case of some of these uh, disorders and some of the sex differences that we see, they may be differential adaptations between males and females that might be related to kind of evolutionary principles. So if you argue that early life adversity for females may want to lead to an increase in the likelihood of being more selective with breeding, you may want to change your nature of impulsiveness, your threshold for um, choice, your different behaviors, whereas for males, you may have the exact opposite consequence. So there may be genetically programmed in male and female differences uh, in response to adversity, which drives precocious development of a subset of behaviors in male that delay those behaviors in females. So in terms of behavioral features of these, you may see kind of the more depressive-like behaviors in females based upon those sort of behaviors. But if you looked at a different set of behaviors, such as uh, impulse control and aggression and so on, you might see a behavioral phenotype in male. And those are some of the studies that we still have ongoing in terms of social behavior in animals. Uh, aggression testing in the males, as well as reproductive um, testing for engagement and reproductive opportunities. So, Great. there's a, there's a, a, a several additional questions, uh, but we are we are just about out of time. So I'll have to ask people to uh, reach out directly to you, Kevin, uh, perhaps through email. Um, and I, uh, I really wanted to thank you for presenting a really fascinating work, and I, know I wanted to give uh, Dr. Lieberman a chance for the last word. Uh, yes, thanks, Kevin, and glad to have you. A wonderful presentation. We look forward to future such uh, 
updates in the uh, in the in next opportunities. So thanks, Jonathan. Perfect. Thank you guys for having me.